I think we're probably all set. So okay. welcome everyone. Sorry about my my emails. It's been a it's been a week already. Monday morning. Uh, so if you are not familiar, we are the main SBDC, and we are very very lucky to have Nicole Lulet from Breaking Even Communications with us to help uh, go into some niche website information. Um, so. Definitely utilize the chat for any questions you have, or if you want to introduce yourself or let us know where in the state you're calling from or what industry, whatever you'd like to share, we would love it. Um, and then after the event, you will get a follow-up email from me that will include a link to the recording and the slides and any other resources that we, uh, we go over today. So keep an eye out for those and otherwise, I think we're probably all set. We got all right. Half here. Awesome. Cool. Well, so I'm Nicole. I'm working from home today and I have a Basset Hound mix. So occasionally I'll mute and look like I'm saying no or go off the screen. And that just means she's barking. So um, like I was telling uh, folks as they were coming in, my goal is to answer whatever. You probably came here with a specific question or at least maybe a general I guess, field of stuff you, you want to know about. And my goal is that you get that answered as part of our, our work together today. So um, my name's Nicole and all you need to know about me, I guess, is that I've had a web development slash marketing company for like 14 years. And I've worked on a lot of different kinds of websites. I have my biases, but I try to be pretty agnostic, um, especially when it comes to small business, because we all need different things. So just to give you a general overview of what we're going to be do today is basically we're going to go over the questions you're going to answer as you're developing a website. And some of these decisions are interconnected, but I've really tried to make this linear because I like I wanted to make this as unchaotic as possible. <laughs> but if it does feel chaotic, just know that stuff does connect at the end. Um, and I also want to just kind of put you in the frame of mind that I know you're, you might be developing your first website right now, or maybe you're redoing your site, but I just want to let you know that um, you're probably going to end up redoing it at some point in, in the future, you know, a couple of years from now. And I equate that to most people do not, you know, live in the apartment that they first lived in in college, right? You know, we've, we, you live somewhere, you get an idea of what you want, and you move on to like something that works a little bit better for you and your lifestyle. And the same is with websites, although there's a lot less boxes involved. And I do sometimes give my opinion, but what I've done is when I give my opinion, I've denoted it with an asterisk. So that is a Nicole opinion versus a something that you need to live by. Um, and I've left a lot of time for Q&A. So if you have a question as we're going, feel free to type it in the chat. Kelsey will interrupt me periodically to pull the questions from the chat. Um, so just don't be shy. You're, you know, we're all here to learn stuff from each other. So the first question or the first thing that you're probably thinking of is everybody needs a domain name. This is how you're going to direct people to your website. Now we live in Maine and there's a lot of old people in Maine. If you're old, that's cool. I love, you know, hey, I love, I love old people. I'm getting there myself. Explaining that people have to type in something dot live or something dot pizza. And that is a perfectly valid, those are perfectly valid extensions that exist. Everyone is used to dot com. And I feel like this will change in the future. But rather than fighting City Hall, I say if you can get a dot com domain, get one of those because everyone is going to assume it's there's a dot com at the end. So you might ask yourself, well, what if my company name dot com is taken? And the reality is you can get a little bit clever, I think, you know, and I put a couple of examples here like join or hello or, you know, whatever, or fake, fake company main dot com, you know, whatever, you know, you can add some modifiers to it to, to be able to get to the dot com. But whatever you pick, even if you don't pick a .com and you decide to go .co, I feel like main.biz works because it's called Main Biz Magazine. I feel like that works, but I feel like that's the exception rather than the rule. Again, if we were in like Southern California and you were opening like a really cool taco stand or something, I might invite you to use .taco, but we're in Maine. I say .com is the way to go. Keep in mind that no matter what you pick, you're going to spell this over the phone conservatively 10,000 times. 
Oh yeah, well, we have some examples. Go over to our website. Oh, I'd love to see your proposal. My email is, so whatever you pick, as long as it is easy to spell and relatively short. So if you're like, well, no, it's like, it's like mover, but with no E and two R's. And like, like I said, you know, I, I think we've all seen those dot coms or those companies and they're trying to get super clever with the name. And I, my theory is that the dot com wasn't, you know, they were trying to find something with dot com available. Uh, that's my theory. And now there are some kind of older school uh, web people who say that basically if you have keywords in your domain, so I put a stupid example here, barharbormarketing.com, that those rank higher. And I think, I think for like the two SEO points you'll get from it, I don't think it's worth having something really generic. I think it's easier if you're memorable. Um, but that is my first opinion. This is, I can't, I don't know how to do an asterisk with my hand, but um, that is my first opinion. Oh, dot com is also okay. We already, we've already got two Nicole opinions in here. So I'm just saying, if you talk to your web person and they tell you something different, I'm not here to ruin your, your web relationship. Now, where do you buy domains? Um, basically I don't care where you buy your domains as long as they charge you what I think is a fair price for them. So as a reseller, I believe we get them for 11 or $12 each. So a lot of companies resell them for like $15, but a company that rhymes with get work pollutions charges $35 for a domain. It's the exact same domain name you can get for 15. So I think that's a little ridiculous. So as long as you're, I feel like paying a fair market rate, I'm cool with wherever you want to buy it. Um, and what I will caution you though, is there's a lot of lazy people in the world and on the internet in particular. And so what they'll do is they'll look at domain searches. And if you've searched a domain name a few times, they're going to be like, oh, someone searched this domain name three times in three days, like, and they'll buy it and then try to sell it to you at a higher price. Because like I said, some people are bored and need apparently better ways to make money than how we're making money. So if you see a domain name and you 80% think you want it, just buy it. It's 15 bucks. Just go for it. And if you're between two domains, just buy them both. And you can, you can do what's called a redirect and you can redirect one to the other. And you can just, when it comes up where it comes time to renew it, you can, you know, just renew the one that you're using. No big deal. Um, they're, like I said, it's, it's the price of like a nice lunch, right? So why not? I see there's a couple of questions here. Kelsey, are they um, questions we should be answering now? We're just getting started with some oh. SEO questions and stuff. So oh, I okay, you'll got probably it. get to that later. Okay, fair enough. All right. So decision number two, and what it sounds like a lot of you are interested in knowing is what software or how do I build the website? Um, so what I've, by the way, full disclosure, I made up these words to differentiate between those two things. So you have what I would call a custom build. So that is you buy a, a domain and web hosting and you install software on your own server and your designer builds something like to your specifications, right? A website builder is you use a tool like a Wix or a Shopify or something like that. And that amount that you're paying every month is to access the software and support whether you're designing the website or the web designer is. So, most businesses I know, myself included, my first three years in business, I used a builder. It was TypePad. Seth Godin's still on TypePad, so I don't feel too bad. But um, it's a, if you want to go look at what websites looked like in 2006, just go look up TypePad. Um, but that was one of the tools that was available at the time. Now we've gotten a lot better in terms of website builder tools. So most companies I know, especially small ones, start with some kind of builder. And then when they have kind of lived with the builder for a while, so in my case, TypePad, there were certain things I wanted to do. Like I wanted to be able to customize my sidebar and I wanted to be able to create pages that had certain archives on them. I had ideas of things I wanted to do once I'd been living with that software for a while. And at that point, three years in, I had a website designed based on what I wanted. So um, I feel like that's a good way to go for most people. Now, if you are say a real estate company and you're like, no, I need to, I need this. I need to pull a real estate data feed. I need to do something really specific. In which case, just obviously have somebody build that right off because these builders weren't meant for that. And I'll get into that in a second. But um, it, I will say, if you are hiring a developer, 
and this is the Nicole opinion, if they say that they use a custom CMS run, a CMS stands for a content management system. So that's software that's used to build a lot of, so for example, WordPress, Joomla, Drupal, these are all content management systems. They're basically website software that runs off of the database. When someone uses a custom CMS, that means that their company built it. So let's say that two years from now, you decide that you don't wanna work with these people anymore. They're the only company that can work in the software they built because it's custom. So what I like to do is I like to say, work with a company or that works in something that is more universal, what's called open source. Um, like I said, WordPress, Joomla and Drupal being some big ones. But if they say that they do custom stuff, the other thing I don't like about custom is like, let's say there's 10 people in the company and they built the software. That's the best that 10 minds have to offer. Whereas with open source, like there's millions of people who are developing in the software. So there's a lot of different people who have stuff to contribute to it. So I think you end up with a better product. But again, Nicole opinion, number three. So let's talk a little bit more about the difference between these two things in a little bit more detail. So there's a lot of website builders out there. I put a couple of popular ones in the examples, but there's other ones too. Usually you pay a monthly fee and sometimes they'll give you a discount if you pay for the year, like 10% or something, or they'll throw in a free domain or something. But the idea is that you are accessing the software. You know, they have maybe how-to videos or other documentation of how to use it. If you get stuck, there's a support chat or something like that for you to be able to get help on your specific issue. Um, but to me, these website tools are great. If you are basically displaying content and, you know, kind of linking to stuff, so before we started, I was talking about um, this company I know who does international events and they set up Wix websites for each of their events. Now they have a conference platform. I forget what it's called. It's some conference platform that lives somewhere on the internet. And um, so what they do is they just have like the agenda, the speaker bios, you know, and all that, you know, pictures of the last conference. And when you click the register button, it actually redirects you to this other place on the internet that handles their conference registration. So if you're just displaying content and linking to other stuff, so we have somebody who's um, setting up a tutoring or a teaching kind of thing. So maybe they're teaching classes, maybe they're using something like Teachable or some other uh, platform to have their courses be online. And so if it's just a matter of displaying content and linking to those other places, these website builders are perfectly adequate. Um, like I said, they usually throw in a free domain, but we know now that those cost $15. And let's just say, if I knew you were paying me $200, I would totally give you something that cost me $11. Uh, because remember, they have to mark up for the resale, um, cause, but they get it for like $11. Like I said, they have support. So if you know, you're know you the kind of person who's DIY and maybe you're working at it at odd times of the day and you need a big company that has you know customer support staff that are online you know, 24-7, they're in chat, you can call them up, you can read articles, you can submit support tickets. Um, that's what these tools have to offer. Usually the templates are pretty easy to customize, you know, and they look nice, um, you know, but they vary in terms of functionality and they vary based on the amount of money that you're paying per month for that particular platform. So what I'm going to do, I spent, um, technically this thing is a Google sheet. I'll, um, maybe Kelsey can, I'll paste it in the chat so that you can access this, but I'm just going to show some examples here. But it's, anyway, this link's in the chat, but what I've done is I pulled it up uh, here in this tab. So my staff and I have spent um, hours <laughs> coming up with this. Uh, it was last updated yesterday. Um, and what I've done here, or what we've done, I should say, I didn't do, I didn't do a lot of this, other people in my company did, um, is we divided it up by the different companies and I color coded it. So we've got Shopify, we have Square, Etsy's in here. It shouldn't be in here, but it's a really long story why it's in here. It was for a specific client and I didn't feel like deleting it. Um, we've got Wix, we've got Squarespace. So those are kind of the major ones. If you have one you want me to add into here, I can totally do that. Um, but what we want to do is we want to compare apples to apples, right? 
And each one of these companies, as you see, has multiple tiers of payment. So let's use the example of Shopify. Uh, now let's use the example of Square, just because there's... So the other thing that's confusing about this is that they're all called... There's Square, Square Professional, Square Performance, and Square Premium. So just within the Square company, we have four levels. And each one of these levels, you're paying a different amount per month. But the more money you pay, typically the more things you get. Now, if you don't care about the extra things you're getting, then obviously you don't need to buy the higher level plan, but it really helps, and we'll get into this in the next question, to know what you want your site to be able to do. So let's take a look at some of the differences between these two platforms. So for example, the credit card processing, when you go from $26 a month to $72 a month, it goes down by 0.3%. Now that doesn't seem like a lot, but if you're doing a certain amount of transactions, maybe that would be significant. Um, so it's important. What I like to do is think of the best business month you've ever had and think of the worst one and run the calculations based on both. But the other thing is, you know, so we have, if you look all the way to the column to the left, we have, you know, what can be, you know, customized. So for example, one of the things that we can get is the abandoned cart emails. So we'll talk more about e-commerce, by the way, in the next workshop. It was kind of too much to put general website and e-commerce together because e-commerce is a whole separate thing. But I just want to give you the example of if you want to send an abandoned cart email, you, you know what I'm talking about? You put something in your cart and then you get an email that says, oh, you forgot this. And they want you to come back and buy it. It's called an abandoned cart email. And they convert really well. <laughs> Fun fact. So you see that at the 26 and the $72 level, we get the abandoned cart emails, but at the lower levels, we don't. So knowing, like I said, the things that you want versus the things that are just nice to haves will allow you to pick what level of thing to go with. Now, what you can do, obviously, is you could look and say, okay, well, what level of square would I need to do the thing I need to do? Okay, let's say I would need the performance level at $26. Let's go look at the Wix plan and see, you know, we've got some stuff here. And so let's say in the higher VIP plan, I get priority customer care. So let's say that like, I want someone, I want to pay a little bit extra for someone to get back to me right away with the website builder issues. Um, so what I guess, is it a little confusing? Yes. Do you not care about most of these things? Yes. But the ones you do care about, you can sort of, you can sort of check. Um, so if you ship a lot and you're looking at shipping discounts, it looks like the top two tiers of Wix offer shipping discounts. Oh, I forgot to check out the abandoned cart email thing. Let's, let's, that's in the, okay. So Wix has abandoned cart emails at all levels, including the $23 level. But the difference, the lowest price Wix plan is $23 and the plan for Square that has the abandoned cart is $26. So not a huge difference for that particular feature. So the biggest amount of work that you're going to do is figure out what you need for your website. And then you can look at a table like this, it's called a features table, and be able to figure that out. Now, these websites are not super straightforward with this, is what I find. Like most people who sell things, myself included, they're really good at saying what they're good at and kind of glossing over what they're not so good at. So if there's a feature you need to have you can hop on their support chat or whatever before you buy, and you can say, hey, I really need a website that does this. Does your software do this? They have salespeople that can answer your questions. But as long as you know what questions to ask, that's the, um, that's the important thing to, uh, to figure out. And that's what we're going to, I guess, spend a fair bit of time kind of talking about today is functionality. So I didn't mean to overwhelm you with my ridiculous um, <laughs> table there. You've got it in chat. You can refer to it at any point. And like I said, if you're considering a different uh, website builder tool and you want me to fill it out for that, I'm happy to add it in because um, it's useful for me too. 
Now, uh, the difference between a website builder tool, which is the things we were looking at, and an open source content management system, like a WordPress, a Drupal, a Joomla, is that with WordPress, with any of these, I download a copy of this software and I put it on your server. And from there, we can add on whatever we want. It's on our server or your server, I should say, and we have control over that. So your only ongoing cost, you're not paying to access like customer support for the builders and you're not paying to use the software, your, you know, your ongoing costs are going to be your website hosting, which is how much space your website takes up and your domain name, which we established is 15 ish bucks a year. Um, most software though, you do need to keep up to date. You do need to do software updates with the builder software. They keep it up to date. That's like part of what you pay for. So to me, open source, it's an open code base, millions of people work in it. So to me, it's, um, it's a great way to get a lot of smart people work. When a lot of smart people work on something, I think comes out better. Um, so that's why I, I like using open source software. Um, and all these examples are open source. Um, but there is no central company. Like there is, I think the people who, it's all like non, most of these are nonprofit sort of run. So it's not like you can email WordPress and say, hey, there's a problem on my WordPress website. Um, you kind of kind of get your own support. Now, the good news is there's a lot of websites that have, that do that, you know, um, or allow, you know, or there's a lot of website developers where if you have a problem, you could just ask them and they could help fix it or whatever, but there's not a central company that you contact. Um, but like I said, the server level access means that we can do whatever we want within reason, obviously, but um, we're not limited. I don't have root access to Square or to Shopify. I can't get on their server. I have to use whatever tools they make available to me. Um, but, you know, WordPress runs 30% right now of websites that are online today. So it's a pretty big market share, which is why a lot of website developers um, specialize in a certain platform like that, because it's a pretty big share of the market and we can build custom things for our clients. So we're going to talk about functionality in a second, which is a major part of what will go into your software picking. But there's other ways that you could pick your software as well. And I just want to throw out there. If there's a couple of websites that you like, you can use a website like whatcms.org. You can type in the domain name. It, it will tell you. Um, so I just pulled one up. I just put in Bangor Daily News before this started and pulled this up. Um, I don't know if anybody has another one. If there's like a website that you like and want to check, you would just type it in here and it would scan the code and tell you what software it was running in. So if you have a couple of websites you like, you can look at that and let's say like four out of the five websites you like runs in Squarespace. Well, there you go. Like you probably like the look and feel of that a lot. So that's one way to look at stuff. Another way to look at stuff is to look up website software specific to your industry. And somebody who has time and energy on their hands probably has blogged about it or something like that. So if I was like, if I was looking for, you know, What's a really great website software that integrates with Salesforce for event companies? I bet there's at least a couple of blog posts about that somewhere. Um, and, you know, the other way to do it, which is what we'll get to in a second, is making the list of what you need your website to do and pick your website software based on what you need it to do in terms of functionality. People have a lot of uh, questions about if you're going with a custom build, you are going to have to get web hosting. Like you've already bought your domain, you're going to have to get web hosting. Um, for most people, it's like 10 to $15 a month is about what you're going to pay in web hosting. Um, I think that's pretty reasonable. Um, by the way, every web developer hates this analogy of like the mailbox, the plot of land in the house on the plot of land. Um, but it seems to work for most people, so I keep using it. So if you're a web developer and you're watching this and cringing, I understand it's an oversimplification, but you know, uh, it does the job. So your domain name is how people refer to you, right? It's like it's like how I just renewed my PO box yesterday, you know. So I just paid for the year to continue using my PO box. Your web hosting is the amount of typically space or the plot of land that your website is on. Now, obviously. Uh, most websites are pretty small because it's mostly text, maybe some photos. Uh, maybe you're embedding a YouTube video, but remember that video lives on YouTube, doesn't live on your site. So, you know, 
it ends up not taking up a ton of room. Now, if you're talking about hosting a website like YouTube or you know anything that does a lot of video or audio, that would take up a lot of room. But in general, for most small business websites, the standard hosting package of most plans works fine. It's you know usually you know between five and fifteen bucks a month, depending on what bells and whistles it comes with. Um, and then obviously you put your website software on your plot of land, you know, uh, WordPress or Joomla or there's like there's tons of them. Um, but I'm just mentioning the couple that are pretty popular. Um, so if you are looking for web hosting, if you're the kind of person who like wants to work in WordPress or like, you know, you want a super custom website, you don't want to use a builder. Um, these are my few examples, uh, things that I would look for in a website host. I like a cPanel interface. It's control panel. Um, I, I sometimes people... <laughs> I sometimes say how much I dislike GoDaddy and people are like, oh, why, why do you dislike GoDaddy? And what it is, is that their website hosting interface is very specific to them. And so I spend a lot of time just figuring out where things are that I typically know where they are. <laughs> so with cPanel, which is called a control panel, if a web host uses that, I know where everything is. You know, it's, it uses the same file names or in the same location. Like I can find everything really quickly. So um, so I like that as your potential person who's working on your website. Also, a lot of web hosts work with what's called Let's Encrypt. So if you probably have heard that sites that load in HTTPS have what's called a secure certificate. It's a little padlock that you see. And secure certificates, um, search engines like them. And if you do any kind of um, e-commerce on your website or take any kind of sensitive information, you do need to encrypt it. So what I like about web hosts that use Let's Encrypt is it's free and it automatically renews itself. So once you install Let's Encrypt Secure Certificate, it'll just keep itself renewed. Um, and a lot of web hosting companies do work with them because this group of people wanted to make it so that every website online could have a secure certificate, uh, regardless of their willing, you know, their ability to pay, you know. Um, and I, you know, I did used to make some money by buying people secure before this existed. I'd have to buy them a secure certificate for 15-ish bucks a year, and I would spend 15 minutes installing it on their domain. But now, I don't have to do that anymore. I can just say, hey, we've got this thing. It comes with. It'll renew itself. And uh, I like, you know, I feel like this, the 150 to 200 a year in web hosting is perfectly reasonable. I once met a client who was paying $500 a month for web hosting, and I almost fell out of my chair. Um because that website wasn't doing anything specific. I hope that she was getting something additionally out of it besides the hosting. But um, I feel like that's a really fair rate for hosting. Um, and like I said, most web hosts, you can buy the domain through them. So if you just are the kind of person that wants to get one bill a year with your domain and web hosting or one bill a month or whatever and have it both be with the same company, most web hosts do sell domain names. So you could kind of do both in the same step. And your web designer, if you decide to work with one, might have somebody that they work with or a company that they like working with, and you could just use them. So, um, yeah. And part of, like I said, picking your domain name, you're also going to probably want to set up an email address. So if you're using a website builder, those guys do not want to get at all into supporting email. So what they've done, so for example, Squarespace, if you want a, a domain email with Squarespace, you have to do a, uh, I think it's G Suite now. Uh, I think it used to be called Google Business. I'm just, I'm trying to keep changing the name of stuff. The Google Business Suite, the G Suite. Basically, you have a Gmail address that is branded with your domain. So for example, my email has my domain, but it's actually a, a paid Gmail address. So what websites like Squarespace allow you to do is say, okay, I want to set up a couple of emails with my domain, and you're going to pay $5 per user per month for those emails additionally. So, um, so like, let's say you wanted, you know, one for you and one for your business partner, and then you both want a third customer service one that you can both check. You're actually paying per login. So you can actually buy two licenses and then make a third email that you both, both can check. It's called an alias. Um, but because you're not logging in separately to check it, they're not going to charge you for a license. A little tip there. So um, just kind of build that into your mind. If you are going to use a website builder and you have 25 people in your company, well, you know, and you want domain emails, well, suddenly that gets a little bit more expensive. Um, web hosting typically includes email. 
So for example, I pay for 10 gigabytes of space on my server and I can use that. I can put up like a bunch of websites. I can put up a couple of websites and make some emails. You know, it's just, you know, the amount of space on my server, it doesn't matter whether it's website files or email files. It's just, I'm paying for X amount of space, however I'd like to use it. And I can decide what addresses I need to set up. So just kind of wanted to put that as email is sometimes of a concern. Uh, but the main thing that's going to kind of be the part that I think is the most important to figure out is what you need your website to do. What functions do you need it to have? And I don't know um, if people have an idea of what those are now that might be interesting to kind of see. Uh, so feel free to you can type them in the chat or, or whatever, but um, I'll go over some examples and then maybe we can pause at that point. Uh, so functionality, what that means is what does your website need to do? And I put some examples of, of things here. So for example, if you wanted a searchable business directory, right? If you think about it, I guess you could make a page for each business and hope when someone types in search that they type in the exact right thing. Um, but maybe you want to put the businesses in different categories. And so if someone picks the, you know, graphic design category, it pulls up all the graphic designers, that kind of thing. So really what you're doing here is you're making individual listings, but you're also making it searchable. So that's like a business directory. You might need booking software. So if you're a bed and breakfast, or if you're a co-working space like I am, and you want people to be able to book stuff and, you know, book for a certain period of time, be charged a certain rate for that booking, uh, get certain information from them as they're booking, you know, that's where booking software would come in. Uh, blog is a whole functionality. If you want to be able to blog, you want to be able to put things into categories, you want to be able to add tags, you want to have commenting turned on. Um, event registration is a whole functionality. So maybe you're an arts organization and you do like concerts and things like that that you sell tickets to but there's only a certain amount of space in your venue. So you only want to sell 50 tickets total and then you want to collect people on a wait list. Um, so that would be like a event registration. Um, it's funny, I'm working with someone now and we keep going back and forth, but he keeps saying he wants custom quoting software and I'm still trying to figure out what he means. Like I, I'm like, okay, like what goes into the quote, you know? Um, <laughs> so, you know, if you, I don't know, yeah, and I'm, I'm still trying to understand what this is, but if we wanted to build something where it asks people questions and it adds on, and then there's a, it pops out a certain amount of money at the end or a range of money, uh, that could be a custom quoting software. Um, e-commerce, we're going to go into next week. So if you're watching this and you like want to set up an e-commerce site, next week's workshop will be uh, more specifically suited for that. But there's a lot of different functionality that can go into e-commerce, which is just selling things online, right? Um, and then, you know, I put in learning management system and LMS. So if you had courses, if you wanted people to be able to download handouts, watch videos, if you wanted people to um, be able to interact with other students and the teacher in some kind of forum, if you wanted to, when they finish the course, send them a certificate of completion. These are all things that a learning management system does. Now, any software, pretty much, whether it's a website builder or anything, it comes with the ability to have a contact form. Um, that's, that's, that's usually built in, but it is technically functional, but anything beyond the contact form is something we have to kind of plan for in terms of functionality. So if you meet with a website designer and they're asking you all these questions about how things are going to work, they're not being nosy jerks. They're really just trying to understand so that they are thinking through this correctly for you. So, um, yeah, you know, like, let's say that you're looking at this and you're like, well, Nicole, like I looked at my four, four out of five websites I like run off of Squarespace and I want to use that, but I want people to be able to book meetings with me. What do I do? What you could do is say, okay, I'm going to look for a piece of software that just does meetings and I'm going to link it to the builder software I'm using. So the example I use here is like, let's say that I wanted, you know, I have a co-working space. I want people to be able to book the conference room. That's the only, besides seeing information about my co-working space, that's the only thing I really want them additionally to be able to do besides reading it or watching videos or what, you know, seeing information on my site. So what I could do is I could look for a third-party plugin. So Calendly, Acuity Scheduling, there's tons of them. And I could build the calendar and get the embed code and put that on my site. 
So there is lots of software that understands that these builder tools are great, but they don't do this specific thing well. So what they've done is set up whole companies that do that specific thing well. So typically, you know, this might be a bit of a monthly fee to access these tools. So for example, I use Calendly for my meetings because what I found was people would book a meeting with me and then flake. And then suddenly I lost a billable hour. I had prepped all this stuff and the person didn't show up. So now I make everyone prepay for our meeting because they're more likely to show up. And then I don't have to chase $125 for three years. So, um, so I do the paid version of Calendly. It's 15 bucks a month. It takes the payment right as they're booking. It sends them reminders of the meeting. It creates a Zoom link automatically. It is worth $15 a month to me um, to have that. And in some of your cases, if you look around, you might find a tool that works pretty well and will be actually a little bit maybe less expensive than you having something custom built or at least at, you know, as well suited. You know, so yeah. So thinking about what you need versus like, oh, that would be nice um, is a good way to kind of pick between the different options that are available. So let me use my example more specifically. So uh, booking calendar. So we have booking calendars that come with WordPress. So this one, it's literally the WordPress plugin is called booking calendar, very helpful. And then we have a third party software Calendly. So what's the difference between these two things? They both do booking, right? Like, what do I care? If, what, which one I have on my site? So what we want to think of is how we want this to work. So in the example of Calendly, if you have ever seen a Calendly calendar, it always looks like that. Oh my God, sorry, that's pixelated now that I've blown it up. Uh, they always look the same. A Calendly calendar will always look like a Calendly calendar. Whereas if I did one that was book, built into WordPress, I could make it very, have a very specific look and, uh, and work a certain way. So I'm kind of limited by what Calendly has to offer me, but I also don't have to make as many decisions as I would if I was building it from scratch with a WordPress, with the booking calendar that I would install with WordPress. Um, there's some events management software I use in WordPress. It's called, ready for it? In WordPress, it's called Events Manager. And the Events Manager Pro version is the paid version that allows you people to buy tickets. But the Events Manager is one that a lot of, uh, you know, theaters and stuff like that use, uh, the free version. And um, within that piece of software, there is 500 settings. I can pick what day of the week I want the calendar to start on, whether it's a Sunday or a Monday or whatever day I want. I can pick uh, what colors different categories are. I can pick what displays when someone hovers over the calendar, whether it's just the event title or event title and thumbnail or event title, thumbnail and description. I mean, when I tell people there is 500 settings, like I'm not exaggerating, I could, I could show you one right now. And that's just with the free version of that software. So if you are like a control freak who wants things to look a certain way, or like has a very specific idea of how you want something to work, putting it on your own site is gonna give you the most control. Um, but if you just want something that like, ah, oh, it's fine. You know, I just want something that where people can book events, then the Calendly thing works fine. Um, guess what kind of person I am? <laughs> So, you know, if you're looking at booking calendars, what are some questions that we might ask you, right, to determine which booking calendar to use? You know, how are we taking, if, are we taking payment? And if so, how? Do you want to accept credit cards? Do you want to accept PayPal? Do you want to accept both? Do you want to let people pick? Um, do people need to get notifications? If so, how do they need to get them? And, you know, what do the notifications say? Do you want them to get texts or emails or both? Do you want this to be automatically added to your own Google Calendar or whatever online calendar system you use? You know, what questions do you want to ask as people are booking? And are those questions required or just kind of nice to know? And is there a calculation that needs to be built in? So in my case, like if someone's booking the conference room, whether they're booking it for two hours or all day, that's going to change how much they're paying. So you know, like I, like I mentioned earlier, if someone's asking you a lot of questions because they're building this for you, it's because they want to make the best decision on your behalf and knowing all of this stuff lets us do that. And there is a lot of possibilities with, with all of these things. Um, so that's just the booking calendar example. 
But if you are, if your heart of hearts, if you're working in Wix and you're like, I like Wix, I want to use it. Great. And, and you need to be able to, you know, like I said, maybe people need to book tutoring time with you. Maybe you just use a third party booking calendar like this. Um, and that, that works perfectly fine. The fourth kind of decisions you're going to make are going to be like, what goes on your website? Uh, what information goes on your website, uh, you know, and kind of planning for where that information is going to go. I don't recommend uploading videos directly to your server. It's going to slow your website down a ton. I have a client and it's so funny. They email me every three months and they're like, our website won't back up. And I go look and I'm like, okay, you guys, we talked about this. Like you got to upload videos to YouTube or somewhere else. Like you can't just upload them to the directory of your website because your website is now 20 gigs big and that's why the backup isn't running. So th these websites were built to be websites. They weren't built to be these giant content repositories. So what we need to do is figure out kind of where, where things live. If you want to upload photos and stuff, that's great. You can resize them before you upload them so they're not giant. That's cool. And not only will that save you money in web hosting over time, but also it will increase, like your website will load faster, which your customers appreciate. You know, and besides obviously the writing photos and videos, we have more like specialized content that we can sort of plan for. And something I always ask people too is like, let's say you have events. Okay, what do you want to do with old events? Do you want there to be a page that has past events on it? Um, so I have some clients who are nonprofits. And so when they apply for funding, they need to show what kind of events they've had. And so I'm like, well, we can just create a page that as events go by, we just, it automatically moves to this past events page and it creates kind of a directory of stuff. So if there's certain information that needs to go away at different points, thinking about, do you want this to be live going forward or do you want it to just go poof and, and get deleted? So that's up to you. Um, a few unsolicited opinions about this. Um, I think any website that's 100% stock photography looks really sketchy. And when I first started my business, I put my picture on my website, not because I'm particularly vain, but um, I saw a lot of these websites that had these like, you know, there'd be the woman with the headset, you know, and, and there'd be the people standing around a computer pointing. And it's like, none of these people work there. So I put my face on my website. And then when I would meet people, they'd be like, oh, hey, they would recognize me. And they'd be like, oh, it's just like on your website. And I was like, yeah, I don't get why people wouldn't like represent what their company is, but okay. Um, so, I mean, if you want to use a little bit of stock photography, like, you know, you're a wedding photographer and there's this, you know, you want to put like bouquets and some things as background images or something, that's fine. But um, anything, actually photography is a bad example. You should use your own photos, obviously, but, uh, I think you get my point. Use stock photography sparingly. Um, I think, you know, and if you're going to take pictures, like take the time to compose them. Photoshop is not a miracle worker and, you know, uh, just take the time to set up the shot. You know, is there something weird behind the person? Is there like a weird cord or something, you know, get rid of that. So for example, I was producing an event last week. And as you see here, I have what looks like a white wall, but what I really have is a giant geology map behind me. <laughs> so I have eliminated the distraction for you. At least I've tried to. My curtain might be a little distracting because I have my fan on, but you get, you get what I'm saying, which is that like kind of think through what this is going to look like as much as you can. And I put a couple of tools, like I think a little bit of cropping, I think a little bit of um, light adjustment and stuff. Just spending a little bit of time, I feel like, gives, gives a good impression. Um, yeah. And for written content, you know, really use the formatting options that your website software gives you. You know, use the headlines, use bullets. Um, if you look at a piece of text and you don't feel like reading it, like, imagine what your customer feels like. So, um, you know, and if you're looking for specific, you know, words that people are searching for, I just put a, a, a Google keyword tool in here. Um, so if you're like, oh, should I talk about, you know, um, should I talk about landscape painting or, um, you know, nature painting? Like, which, which word should I use? Like, what, what are the kids saying these days? You can go to Google Trends. Also, I'm not sure, like, I did a four-week SEO workshop with the SBDC earlier this year. I'm not sure. I think those archives live somewhere if you want to go kind of get into the search engine stuff. But just, I guess what I'm saying is as you write words, think about words your customers are using to search you generally. 
And um, when in doubt, if you have a, a block of text, try cutting it in half. That's like my <laughs> editing tip. As you see, I'm a little long winded, so I need to do that. Um, and as you're setting up your website, people are going to be on different pages of your website and they're going to be like, oh, I really like this company or, oh, like this is great. And the kind of implicit question in there is, so what do I do now? Like, I think you're great. Like, what do I do now? And these are what are called calls to action. So when someone gets to a page and wow, I like it, what should they do next should be very clear to them. And so these are some ideas of calls to action. Um, for you, it might be different on different pages. Now, obviously, if someone gets to my homepage, like they don't really know me yet. So I'm not going to be like, oh, hey, you should hire me for like $10,000 to do a lot of work for you. Like, we got to ease into this, right? So I might say like, oh, learn more about me or, you know, schedule an exploratory call or, you know, watch this free uh, Google Analytics webinar that I did or whatever. You know, those are the kind of things that are on my homepage. Now, if you're like on my, if you're like three pages deep into my marketing stuff, now I'm asking if you want to like talk about working together or something like that. So just kind of think through if you're looking at the page that you're building, whatever, in whatever software, is it clear what they should do next? The person who's looking at this. Um, and then, you know, design elements. Like I said, you're going to make design decisions as you're going along. Um, and I guess the, there's different ways to approach web design. I'm working on this right now with a college student. So um, it's in progress, but this is uh, a concept called a style tile where we basically get the look and feel of what the client wants. So she has a jewelry product um, and she likes classic and she wanted something that felt designer. So I got that font. Doesn't that headline font look like the um, New Yorker magazine font? <laughs> I, just, I don't know. Something about it that kind of reminds me of that. Um, you know, and black and white obviously is classic, but I didn't want to go with like black and white and red all over. I wanted to go with kind of more classic stuff. So like, like a kind of gold color and a dark green. This is a little more unexpected maybe. Um, so yeah, so what we've done here is we picked some fonts, we picked some colors, we picked uh, like a style of button. We've looked for examples of photography she might like, um, textures, backgrounds, that kind of thing. And it just kind of gives you an idea of we can kind of as I'm building the website, I'm gonna make sure that I use these elements as I build it. And it's gonna give it a cohesive look. I think we've all seen like when little kids learn to use PowerPoint and then they use, you know what I mean? They use all the colors and all the transitions and all the fonts like at the same time. And it feels really chaotic. There's something that feels really put together if you kind of have things narrowed down to a few colors, a couple of fonts, you know, and have a certain style laid out. And what I recommend for people is, you know, uh, use Google fonts because they're free and they're usually on just about every platform. Um, and there's like 800 of them or something. So I bet you'll find something that you like in there. And uh, in terms of picking your colors, just um, you want a couple that are more neutral and a couple that are, you know, so you want light and dark because you want something that contrasts uh, high enough because you want it to be readable. So you know, you obviously want some neutral and maybe you want some, and then you want at least one bright color for links and buttons, things like that. So, um, and if you look at some of your favorite websites, you'll notice that you'll notice there's some neutrals, you'll notice there's some more bold stuff. And then you'll notice there's like at least one bright color or some one color that is used for, for things that are links, you know, and, uh, like I said, just limiting things can be, can make things really non-chaotic and what you'll notice, whether you, you use like you know, look at WordPress themes or whether you're in, you know, Weebly and you're picking out a, a template is that designs come in a few flavors. You know, there's what's called a one column, a two column and a three column. And the idea is with, you know, the one column, everything you're looking at is kind of front and center. A two column kind of gives you a sidebar, which lets you put stuff in, you know, subscribe to the email or follow us on social media, that kind of thing. I've only ever done one three column website that I don't hate. Um, I won't link it here because it's kind of old and still online, but um, three column, and technically there exists four column websites. Don't do that. Another unsolicited Nicole opinion. I've never seen a four column website that I like. It's chaotic. It's like reading a newspaper in a bad way. 
And then I put links to a couple of other things you can care about. This is more if you're building this on your own. These are things you have direct control over because, right, our WordPress install or whatever is on our server, right? We have, whereas if we're using Squarespace or Wix or whatever, we're kind of at their mercy. Um, and I just put a link here if you want to get more into design. There's a book called Don't Make Me Think, and it's all about user experience design. So like how to use, because when people look at stuff, they don't want to, they don't want to think through how it works, right? They want it to just work. They want it to be intuitive. So um, yeah, anyway, I put a link there. It appears to be a free version of the book. I don't know why. Uh, and uh, a sixth decision, if you're taking payment, is what online payment processor or processors you're going to use, right? Because you need something that's going to interface with the credit card or whatever. Um, you don't want to be in that business, trust me. Uh, so, you know, the main one that I like a lot is stripe.com. It charges the same rates as Square does, um, except it's an online only processor. So it's a 2.9% plus 30 cents a transaction. So super standard, uh, but there's tons of different payment processors out there and it will just depend what works with the software that you're using. Um, and which one you pick will depend on transactions per month. So for example, authorized.net has a monthly fee, Stripe doesn't. But I think authorized.net at a certain point has a lower processing rate for in-person payments. So if you have the kind of business that has a storefront and an online store, and you're trying to evaluate for both, something that has a monthly fee but lower processing fees, depending on how many transactions you're doing, might be worthwhile. So that's why I say, look at how much they're charging and do the math for the, your slowest month and your busiest month, and you'll be able to see whether it's taking too much or not. And uh, like I said, there's, like with anything else, there's a lot of choice related to this. But um, this online processor basically interfaces with your software. So for example, with our Calendly or with the booking calendar in WordPress, Stripe interfaces with both of those things. So when someone goes to make a payment, they're actually, it's saving the information on stripe.com. It's not being stored on my website. So if suddenly they wanted a refund, I would go to stripe.com and issue the refund from there. And on Stripe, I can't see the credit card. I can just see the last four digits of it. Um, so it completely encrypts that information, even for me as the business owner. So um, it's really secure. And like I said, most of these processors will take that money and it will sweep it into your bank account every 24 hours, um, something like that. And this is the final question. And then we'll have a lot of time for everybody's specific questions. Um, should I hire a designer or developer, right? And here's the thing. Obviously hiring someone to do it versus doing it for yourself, you're gonna pay more money to someone else. You're, you're, you're free, right? <laughs> but I mean, you're freeing up your time to theoretically do other things if you're paying for a designer. Uh, but if you're looking at words, usually someone who's a web designer is a little bit more user experience. So they're gonna be kind of more into like, you know, the fonts, the colors, like the look and feel of it. And a developer is more related to functionality. Most website firms like, kind of have both built in, you know, uh, but they're usually better at one thing than the other. And if you just go look at a couple of their clients, you'll be able to see whether they're more on the functional side or more on the, uh, on the aesthetic side. And there's nothing wrong with either approach. Um, I myself, as you see with my slides, am much more of a functional person. <laughs> I produced this conference last week and there were the most beautiful slides. I had such slide envy. I was like, I should make beautiful slides. That'll just be something I, I want to do someday. But, uh, you know, basically, you know, most, you know, some designers and developers actually specialize in the website builders. So are there some people who just build Shopify websites or there are some people who just build Wix websites and all of these like tools, if you go on Wix or if you go on Shopify and you go to their like designer marketplace or something, you'll see designers who work in the software. You'll be able to look for them there. Um, also, you can just search, you know, Shopify designer, website designer near, near me or something, and they might have a listing on their own website too. But, um, you know, so there's people who specialize in certain builders. There's also people like me who specialize more in like a certain content management system. In my case, WordPress. Someone else might specialize in Drupal. Someone else might specialize in, I don't know, Magento. That's a card software. I haven't used it in a while, but 
So there's certain, usually it's, it's kind of like speaking a language, right? Like if you're going to get good at it, you know, you're going to probably specialize in a particular language. And uh, that's true of website designers slash developers. And uh, in terms of what you'll pay for a website, according to Website Magazine, the average website costs between $2,000 and $10,000. And um, if you're remembering when you paid your cousin Bill to design your website 10 years ago for 500 bucks, I will talk about why prices have gone up in a second. Um, and, you know, most designers and developers will quote on project or scope. Like I charge 125 bucks an hour, but like I do work by the project. So like I will give you a quote and say, hey, you know, and most web designers slash developers work this way. They'll be like, this is what you're going to get. This is how the process is going to work. And typically there's two revision periods in the design phase. Otherwise you're in infinite revisions because the client doesn't want to pay you. So we usually write that in. Um, it's not because we're trying to be jerks. It's because that uh, we have bills too. Um, you know, and they'll say like, kind of like, okay, this is what you're providing versus what I'm providing. So are you might be writing all the content or providing all the photos, for example. I might be, you know, pur purchasing the software licenses, you know, for your use, you know, uh, whatever. So it'll usually be pretty clear on kind of what, what you're in charge of and what they're in charge of. But with most website designers and developers, part of what you're paying for is they're driving that process for you. You don't have to think about all the stuff. If you're DIYing, like you're in charge of the project. If you've hired someone else, they're they're in charge in terms of like they can pace things and kind of hold you accountable and, and make sure stuff moves forward. Um, and you know, sometimes people say, Well, I want to have an RFP, and that's a request for proposals. So they'll be like, Oh, we want a website redesign. So we're gonna write up everything we want and put it out to bid. And I'm just gonna say if you do that only big companies are gonna bid on it. Like I can't afford to bid on RFPs. I did it once, or no, I've done it multiple times, but once really burned me. I went on three different interviews. I spent 45 hours writing a proposal for this very big project and then I didn't get it. So we lost thousands, my company lost thousands of dollars in me spending time pursuing that. And so now I just work with people who wanna work with me directly. So if you do an RFP, just know like, if you just wanna say like, you only wanna work with big companies, that's perfectly valid. And it's something you can definitely do if you want people to kind of bid on your project. You can also, you know, say here, hey, here's what I want and get quotes from multiple designers. That's completely normal. Um, that's something I do a lot. And um, in general, I would say that I know it feels like the web design process is going to be something that's started and finished. But in reality, you're going to need to be able to revisit that or change things or whatever. And so you want someone that you feel comfortable and is easy to work with. And as a final slide, I just want to talk about like why websites have gotten expensive, which is when your cousin Bill designed that website 10 years ago, he was designing for like two screen sizes. Now I'm designing a website that can look good on my phone, uh, that can look good on an iPad, that can look good on my 17 inch computer screen, that can look good on someone's 30 inch computer screen. So you get the idea. I have to basically design um, for a lot of different screen sizes and browsers. So that's fun. I remember I, I, did a, I did a website. It was a real estate website. So it had to be approved by real estate, some company that did, did the real estate. And they found all of these problems and we couldn't figure out what it was. They were testing it in a beta version of Internet Explorer. So we had to go and fix all these things for a version of Internet Explorer that hadn't even been released yet. Um, but anyway, um, we're also designing things to be fast loading. So we, you probably have seen that most people access the internet on mobile devices at this point. Like there was a kind of crossover period <laughs> where like mobile was taking off and desktop use is going down. And so because people are accessing websites on mobile networks, we have to make sure that they load faster. When you're on Wi-Fi, everything works great when you're at your home office, when you're in the, you know, when you're somewhere and you're, you're trying to ping a cell phone tower, it's a little bit slower. So we have to kind of um, keep that in mind as well. Um, our costs have gone up. I, I just looked and I pay about $1,500 a year just in software licenses that I use with my clients. Um, and if someone's a continuing client, I just let them use my developer license. Um, so that's, uh, that's a cost I have. And honestly, it takes time for me to prepare options. So like I had a client who did um, boat tours. And so they needed software because it was the same times every day. So they needed an event management software that would repeat the times that would only fill the boat to a certain capacity. 
and with a certain amount of children versus adults, um, they needed um, like a, some kind of weather uh, contingency plan and kind of deploying that. So I had to look at a few different event management solutions before I found the one that was going to work for their purposes. Um, you know, I don't know everything, but I kind of know where to look. So I feel like I'm probably faster at that process than hopefully the average person. And honestly, there's a lot of communication that needs to happen throughout the web design process. So we have to build in for that. We have to build into going to meetings and presenting stuff, especially to groups of people and things like that. So if you're looking at this and saying, well, I'd rather spend my money on professional photography. I'd rather spend my money on making a really great uh, video talking about my business. I'd rather uh, spend that money on functionality. Like I'm going to buy, um, you know, I need to buy a conference platform. That's totally fine. And I'm clearly not going to judge you for it. We all we understand. I just wanted to kind of lay the case in case you got what you thought was a really high quote from web designer, where that was coming from. Um, and it's not that we're trying to gouge you. It's that these things just take a lot more time than people think. And my favorite clients actually are people who have tried to do it themselves. And then they come to me. Um, they're my favorite people because they know how much work it is. So anyway, that's what I got. And I'm happy to answer people's questions at this point. Yeah, so uh, it looks like there's one. Yep. Yeah, that last I one yep. is uh, okay. this one. So the first decision to make, and actually, Michelle, we can use it as an example if you, if you want. Um, do you think you're going to use a website builder or do you think you're going to like build something custom from scratch? From scratch. Okay, great. So now we need to find a domain name and web hosting for you to build this thing. So I have already bought the name through GoDaddy. So I got nice. that. Yeah. All right. Check. And, um, and I think like we understand like what functions we want mm -hmm. and what calls to actions we want mm -hmm. and the look and the feel of the colors, et cetera. Great. So if I'm understanding correctly, I would need to now find a host. Yes. To... And, I don't, and this is where I don't, I get mixed up between a server and a host and, but we need someone to put it out there in the space, right? And so, then, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I'm understanding how it yep. all clicks together and it, they, they can all be different people, right? So we're the developer, or excuse me, we're not the developer. We're, well, yeah, I guess we are the developer. Yeah, yeah. If you're doing it yourself, you are. Ta-da, mm -hmm. you're, you're developing. Um, okay, so I'm just pulling up a couple of different hosting ex I'm just pu pulling out a couple of, uh, okay. So I'm gonna share my screen and let's talk a little bit about, and I've just pulled up two large providers of web hosting. So this is SiteGround. Um, and as you see, there is, oh, it's a special price. All right, mm -hmm. so let's see what it comes with. So $6.99 a month comes with 10 gigs of space, comes with up to 10,000 visits monthly. So what some of these shared web hosts have is, is like, let's say you got written about, I don't know, in the New York Times, and suddenly you got a ton of traffic. Like, you would probably have to upgrade your hosting to be able to handle that. Now, what I tell people is, sometimes when you have problems, when you have the problem, you will have the money to solve the problem. So if you are getting too much attention mm -hmm. and that is, you know, you'll be able to upgrade your web hosting at that point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you dollars more a month. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But it's something to keep in mind. Like if you know an article's coming yeah. out or whatever, that's something too to, to tell your web host if like, oh, hey, I just got written about in this, um, you know, in this international whatever, and they're linking to us just, and it's coming out, you know, May 30th, just FYI. So they can at least prepare for the traffic so that your website doesn't tank. Okay. So is 10,000 visits monthly not not much for a small business, local, main, small business? Most websites I look at when I start working with them have between like five and 20 visits a day. Okay. Okay. So, um, and as you see, it says free SSL. So I'm guessing, look, it says includes free Let's Encrypt. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. Uh, so yeah, free email. Okay, create professional email address with no extra costs. Create as many accounts as you need. So in this case, like they're like saying, hey, you have 10 gigs of space. 
if you want that to be 100 emails in one website or 35 websites in three emails, like whatever, we don't care as long as it's in total less than 10 gigs of space. Um, and yeah, so now we go up the next level. Oh, that's for one website. <laughs> okay. So if you want more than one website, you got to go up to this plan with this particular software. And as you see, you get a little bit more space, you get a little bit more monthly traffic, but uh, nothing else is super different. Oh, staging, fun. Um, okay, so don't mind me. I'm, I don't know if I want to talk about staging right now, but if you're an internet nerd and want to basically develop something, but not on your live website and then move it live, that's what staging is for. Um, so yeah, all right. So we're looking at $6.99 a month versus $9.99 a month depending on whether you want one website or multiple websites with this particular, with SiteGround. So now let's look at Bluehost. Oh, come on. There we go. Okay. So see, when you saw my intense features table, mm -hmm. <laughs> now, now, now we're used to looking at that at this point. So, okay. So let's take a look here. So $3.95 a month. Oh, I look at- You're on sale too. <laughs> but wait, 36 month term. Yeah. I, that's I'm highlighting it right now, right there. 36 month term. Interesting. Um, so one website, you get 50 gigs of storage and they're not saying anything about email yet, which is interesting. Includes one free domain name. They threw in $11 gift for you, for you paying them whatever, 395 times 36 months. Um, and free SSL, which I'm guessing is the um, Let's Encrypt. Yep, they're powered by Let's Encrypt in tiny font there. Okay, so let's $5.95 a month. But again, we're it's a 36-month term. I think that's a little... And there it doesn't mention anything about email. So I don't know if all plans include. Okay. Scalability. We include scalability. Cool. I kind of <laughs> figured you did. Like, it's so funny how like they say things like this. So anyway, so as you see, you're paying so so you're paying between three ninety five and nine ninety nine a month. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's not a. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a huge difference. I don't like to be locked into three year contracts. That's just me. You know, I have a fear of commitment. So. Um, that might be part of it. So I would just, I don't know. And, and there, there's lots of other web hosts too. You can, you can, you know, you can look around at other web. If you, if we Google web hosts, there's so many Google ads because, you know, people are, when people Google web hosts, they're ready to spend money. Um, you know, and then I have, you know, I, I use my, my friend has a web hosting company. It's like a small web hosting company, but he has all of the features that I mentioned. And I think I pay 120 a year or something like that, which I think is pretty good. Um, so yeah, so just like I said, look at these. You don't need to be intimidated by features tables, um, but I like that this site ground comes with uh, email. I think that's interesting. Um, and I think that's an important thing. And if we see here, look, this one includes, oh, it includes 30 days of, micro, of Office 365. <laughs> that's so obnoxious. Ugh. Wait, hold on. This is 36 month pricing. Let's switch to 12 month pricing. So you see how I switched to tw like, okay, 12 months. All right, $5.95 a month, $7.95 a month. Okay, now we're in similar line with the, uh, of the other ones. I'm just looking, like I said, it doesn't seem, this one doesn't seem to include email. So if you want email, then obviously not this one. If you're planning on using something like G Suite anyway, then it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, but I feel like these are both okay options in terms of, I mean, they're in line with the pricing I'm suggesting, which is normal. Okay. Um, so yeah, you would find a web host and most web hosts, if you just, if you just email them and say, hey, can you install WordPress for me? They'll, I mean, at least my friend will do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, I'd, or I, or I, you know, someone like me can, you know, hey, can you install WordPress for me? You know, get me in shore, here you go. And you can, uh, you can build it, build it from there. Um, so I would assume that the second step is really getting Wix or somebody to develop the templates. And then once it's all together, then we contact these hosts. No, no. Okay. A custom build with WordPress or Joomla or whatever mm -hmm. is on the host. If you're using a builder like a Wix or a Squarespace Wix. or whatever, that's on their own server. 
they're hosting, they're basically getting money from you at all points. They're right. selling you the domain name, they're selling you email, they're selling you the software, slot, and, and they're hosting it for you. Okay. So they are, they are a complete ecosystem. So, and that's, that's kind of nice in a certain way, right? Because you're, you have one place to log into, all the support is there, all of the tools are in one, are in one place. But like, let's say you were like, oh, I really wish I could um, sell gifts, open-ended gift certificates or something. And let's say that Squarespace didn't offer that. You gotta wait till they offer it because they're a private company and they have to develop, you know, so you can make, make, you make a request for certain features, but if they're not available when you sign up, you know, there's no guarantee they'll be available immediately, you know, after you sign up. Okay. So what you want to do is figure out what your site needs to do and then make the decision based on that. So in terms of your site, are, are there certain things that you want your website, your dream website to be able to do? So it's kind of a unique scenario. I, I bought a domain name, which is my company LLC, but yep. then we started another LLC, which is actually a plaza. <laughs> So my business is inside of a plaza. So what I think I'm going to, and I don't want to buy multiple websites and, and manage multiple websites. Sure. So what I was thinking about doing was just taking my business name because people, I'm established and people know that mm -hmm. name and then have a landing page basically where you can then find out more about the plaza and the different retail shops within that plaza, including oh. me. So that's great. That, that's yeah. a great, that's a great workaround. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you could totally use a bill. It sounds like mostly it's going to be information. It is exactly it. So yeah, like just putting up menus for one yeah. of them. Um, if we're having an event, you know, uh, hours, that kind of thing. So yeah. And just, you know, all of these softwares usually allow about a two week free trial. So mm -hmm. if you're between, if you're like thinking, you're like, oh, maybe this, oh, maybe this, like you could sign up for a trial and just see how you like the interface. Like if you feel comfortable in it. If you feel like, you know, if you get stuck on something and, and look up help, if you feel like you're able to get help on that, um, it's a lot of, it's a matter of like level of comfort, to be honest with you. A lot of these tools are, I mean, they're well-built. Um, mm -hmm. They didn't exist, you know, when I was first starting. So um, I think it's nice that we have a lot of options now for people who are kind of starting off with, with their first websites. But um, yeah, I don't have anything super bad to say about any of them. I, like I said, I've run into mostly specific functionality issues. So um, I had a client who built a whole store in Wix and uh, she wanted, she had, uh, she does maple products. So raw maple syrup is not taxed because it's a natural product, but maple candy is. Mm. And in Wix, everything in your store is taxed at the same rate, unless you buy or and integrate a specific add-on. That's kind of a pain in the butt. So she was like, oh, I wouldn't have picked this if I would have known that, you know, but um, so that's why I'm thinking like, if you, the more you know about and what we you know, need, yeah. exactly. Like, I, I, that's a good point. I'm a food business. The other shops in the plaza are not, but I run into the same thing between prepared tax, food tax and non-prepared foods. Plus I have right. alcohol. So if I started having a cart, yeah. then I would run into those challenges. Okay. Right. And, and that's why we, we split out when we, when I was talking with the SBDC about these workshops, we talked about basically splitting out the e-commerce separately because that does have specific ramifications, but, um, but yeah, you know, there's most other things that are not, um, e-commerce are usually things you can sort of work around, like, uh, that have third-party solutions. Like it's like my Calendly solution, instead of using booking built into the website, um, that kind of thing. So I just say whatever interface you feel most comfortable working in is a great interface for you. Okay. Great information. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Does anybody have any other questions? I see we lost some people. I hope they're okay. We did have a question about SEO. Sure. Um, could, could you do a, a, a minute and a half breakdown sure. of SEO instead of our right. four week program? Sure. <laughs> Search, uh, SEO is search engine optimization. So it's making sure that your website does well in searches. Now, a lot of people get hung up on trying to trick Google and doing like crazy things. The reality is that search engines are used by people. So you, you know, 
you basically want a few things to kind of signal to the internet, Google, et cetera, um, to the search engines that you care about your own website. Number one is you want content on your site that people are looking for. So, you know, you're, if someone is looking for, you know, uh, wedding photographers, Portland, and you don't have the word wedding photographer anywhere on your site, Google's not clairvoyant. It doesn't know that. So you want words that people are looking for. You also want uh, links to be coming into your site because part of what search engines do is they figure that if you're, you know, if there's two equivalent websites and one of them has 200 links coming into it and one of them has two, then the one with 200 probably is better, right? So that's what they figure. So if other sites are linking to you, that's, that signals that you're a trustworthy kind of uh, website. So words people are looking for, links coming into your site, and that your content is, uh, is, is updated on a regular basis. So um, if you haven't touched your website in six months, Google goes back and scans it and sees nothing new has changed. It's gonna say, oh, the site hasn't changed in six months. Maybe I'll come back and scan the site in nine months. I'll wait a little longer next time. So what you want is just some something to be happening on your website generally, because yeah. So search, so these are little things that you can do that signal the search engines that you care about your website and that allow you to rank better over time. I hope that was succinct enough. But there's a four-week workshop if you want to get into it. Uh yeah, that was great. Um, it looks like Jody's asking, I yes. use Square to take payment. Do you see that one? Does it make sense to yep. use a website builder that uses Square for taking payment? Okay, so I have a few customers who who use Square as their um point of sale, either at 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 um at craft fairs or at a physical store location. And if you want inventory to cross-reference, so let's say you have three, I don't know what you sell. Say you have three scarves and you sell two at the craft fair and you want it to update so that if someone's in the store, like they can't try to buy two scarves because you don't have, because you just sold them. I would say the, the reason it would, it would, it could make sense to use the same thing on your website is for that inventory control because you'd be in the same system. And so it'd be talking to each other. Um, if it's the kind of thing where that's not really a problem because you can either get more or make more easily enough, then, um, then you don't necessarily have to use that. But I find Square is good. It's just a little bit limited. And I will say, if you're going to use Square to build your website, um, the platform that squareup.com uses is technically called, it's Weebly for their website. Because what happens if you look up Square website gift cards, it pulls up all this stuff about Squarespace. So if you are using Square, just know like to actually, if you're using squareup.com as a processor and want to use it for your website, the actual software being used is called a Weebly. Um, so if you're searching for how-to articles, that's going to, that's add, we put like Weebly gift cards, how-to. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it could make sense to use Square if you want that inventory control. Um, but I would say, uh, yeah, in terms of its e-commerce functionality, it's it's okay. And honestly, they did a lot at the beginning of the pandemic. They kind of impressed me with how much they did as a company. So, um, yeah, so, and we do have that e-commerce event. Yeah, soon. yeah, next we week. can talk more about e-commerce specifics mm -hmm. next week. Yeah, yeah. So it's just hard to get into building a website, and as you see, e-commerce specifically has a lot of issues. So. Um, I'm looking at Carolyn's question here, but is the best plan or your recommendation if one just wants a website to showcase their artwork and purchase directly from me? Okay, so if someone purchases the artwork, Carolyn, um, so is there, you want them to contact you to purchase it? I'm not sure if it's the kind of thing where like, this is a $10,000 painting and you don't want people to put the credit card into the website because um, it would take 2.9% of that. So do you see people contacting you to make the purchases because they're kind of a larger kind of purchase item? Carolyn, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So what I would do then is I would put a, a link to a contact underneath each painting or something. I would say, want to purchase? Contact us, you know, and click here. And one of the questions you can ask in your contact form is, you know, uh, you know, you can have like reason for inquiry and there can be a drop down and it can be like, you know, purchase painting, general info, you know, uh, press request or something. Um, 
I like to put press requests as an option so people can be like, oh, they get press. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I would say like, you know, uh, so I would link them to your contact form and let them reference the specific painting they want to purchase. So in that case, since you're not actually, you're not really, do, you're sort of initiating e-commerce, but you're not actually taking the payment. So it's not like full on e-commerce. You can use whatever software you feel most comfortable building in. Because like I said, they all come with contact forms that's by default that's like the default functionality they all have so um so my best plan or recommendation would be the software you feel most comfortable using and like i said if you guys just want to go and you know do the website tour and like you know try try squarespace for two weeks and try wix for two weeks and whatever and just kind of see which one you like best and go with that that's i think a perfectly fine thing All right. Let's I don't know if no one's me. talking because like they're just like, oh my god, that was awful, or like, is everyone okay? <laughs> it's I Monday, just, you know. We're all I, just I doing the best we can. No, no, that's fine. I'm just <laughs> making sure that like this wasn't too overwhelming or weird. Um, oh, Fiona has. Oh yeah, her. sure, Fiona, um, go for it. Free to Sorry, just trying, yeah. trying to figure this out. Um, so I'm an artist as well, and have. Um, been thinking about mostly I'm looking at a website as just uh, a presence. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure about about sales through the website exactly. But um, in that thought, I mean, you're talking about developing a, a website and then being able to sort of graduate to the next step. Once you have a domain name, how easy is it to transport from sort of like if you start with with even a free you know, Weebly space or one mm -hmm. of the really lower, lower tiers and, and then feel like you're ready to graduate. How easy is it to shift? Easy. Easy. Yep. Even from, even from like Weebly to um, WordPress or wherever you want to go. Well, you're going to have to like move your content. Um, but you know, it's a copy and paste situation. It's not the most work you're ever going to do is the first website because you're thinking through everything for the first time. You're finding all those pictures of your work and putting them there and, and sizing them so that they're all the same size. And you're writing up your artist statement and putting it in place. If you're moving to another platform, yeah, you're copying and pasting that stuff, but you've already gathered it all together. That's like the most labor intensive part of it, to be completely honest. So... I don't think the move would be too difficult. I, I've moved platforms a couple of times. Um, you know, I, I've moved platform actually three times in 14 years. So, and you can do things like export databases and stuff too. That's, that's totally um, within the realm of things. But for most small businesses, it's just a few pages of content with some images and stuff. Uh, I could move that in a couple of hours probably. Okay, and, and and you talked earlier about um, like if you can't decide on the domain name, you can purchase a couple of them, and then yeah. you can link together. One of the one of the problems that we have is that we are, um, and my partner and I have two different you know two different last names. Then mm -hmm. we had a third name as our studio name, and it it gets very very long. <laughs> totally. Yep. You can't put it all in one. Yep. Right. So I'm trying to consolidate if, if, would that be a suggestion is to purchase like domain names um, that are more specific to each of us and then link them to a, a studio name? Yeah. What you could do is like um, you could redirect them. So let's say you had like, you know, FionaClark.com. And when someone clicked on that, they went to your page on the studio's website or they click on your partner's name and it redirects to your partner's page on the studio website you know like so you can make i think that's what i would do um yeah yeah i don't see why that wouldn't be possible okay yeah it's it's, it's, it's and it's called it's called a redirect so like uh yeah so the like like even with um weebly or whatever you could do that that i'm not sure Oh, is that more custom to redirect? Yeah, with, with custom, I can, like I said, I can make all things happen. But uh, let's see if Weebly redirect. I'm just doing a quick. Um... Okay. 
Okay, redirects. Okay. Okay, if you move domains to Weebly, you can set up 301 redirects in the editor, which signals a permanent site move. Okay, it looks like they let you do it in Weebly, according to this. There's a whole video that I don't feel like watching of exactly how to do it, but uh, it looks like it's possible. Okay, so that's something I should maybe pay attention to when I'm looking at. Yeah, so it's called a 301 redirect. It's just like a permanent. So if someone types it in, it, it permanently redirects them. So um, so a redirect forwards visitors from one URL to a new URL. So if they type in Fiona Clark, it would redirect them to studiowebsite.com slash Fiona Clark or something. You could... So it looks like that's possible. Like I said, I don't want to watch the video, obviously, while we're all on a call together, but I'm 90%. Right. It, it seems like that's a possibility. And so it is, I mean, we once had a website that has been dysfunctional for years. Mm -hmm. um, and it would it would it link a, a, a dead website? No, you... Okay. You would have to, I mean, there'd have to be... Like, I mean, if I wanted to make like nicolasawesome.com redirect to my TikTok page, I could do that, even though it's not like a website <laughs> that I own. Um, but like, yeah, I could redirect them to a website that was dead, but then that would be pretty discouraging. So, I mean, you can make the redirect well, I mean, go wherever you some, want. Like if somebody were looking for us in our sort of our, our old enterprise mm -hmm. um, and that that is sort of non-functional. Mm -hmm. I, 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 this comes up because I actually just got a call the other night from somebody who bought a piece, you know, 20 years ago and is looking, looking for us now. Yeah. Uh, and so things have sort of changed. Um, but we still, you know, we still can be found apparently. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it could be, so there's something, do you guys know about the way back machine? Yes. <laughs> so I'll just do a really quick thing for the people on this call that might enjoy super old websites. There's this thing called the Internet Archive. They call it the Wayback Machine. And you can put a link to any website and it will tell you, it will show you what used to exist there. Um, I feel like mine's funny. So let's do that one. I have a client who whose domain name got bought and sold a bunch of times. So his is really funny. But I already blogged about that. So this is every time the website was screenshotted is, is, uh, is here. So I could go all the way back to 2008 and if I go, this is what my website looked like on June 21 of 2008. Let's all cringe together. Oh, it's going to be ugly. Come on. <laughs> oh, see, look, it was a type pad site. Okay, that doesn't exist anymore. That's why it's like freaking, oh, come on. Um, so if you need to like reference, like, let's say that your website, you knew it had. Look at that. <laughs> It was very cool for 2008, you guys, okay? It was so cool. But um, yeah, if you need to reference older content, you can use the Wayback Machine and kind of see an older version of your of a domain that even if you don't own that domain anymore, you could at least go back and sort of grab stuff from there if you need to, so. Oh, cool, okay, yeah. great, thank you. It saved my butt a couple of times. I had a client who, they, they didn't tell me they needed this content. And then like three years later, they were like, hey, where are these PDFs? And I was like, I thought you said you want, they're like, no, we want them. So I went in the Wayback Machine and they were, they were there. So I grabbed them. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Anyway. So. Okay. Thanks. That answers. No problem. Most <laughs> I know if you feel like you've been run over by a truck, I totally get it. There was, there was a lot that happened today and I understand. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you're not going to make a terrible decision. None of these are bad options. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to put that out there, um, and there's nothing wrong with using something to um, to start off with and get an initial feel for. But once you pull together all that information, and if you want to move it to another platform, it's it's a lot easier the second time around. The first time you're just getting your head around everything. So just cut yourself a little bit of slack there. I think that's great advice. And, and Allison and Diana, everyone's saying this was great and they're just taking notes full time. So that's, that's you know. All right. That's a good time. Yeah. So next week will be e-commerce and full disclosure. I haven't done all kinds of e-commerce all the time. So um, I'll do the best I can answering. Uh, I, I've worked on four platforms, but not all of them. So uh, yeah. So if you have more e-commerce specific questions, come next week.
or, or send them to Kelsey and we can address them in the, uh, in the broadcast and you can see it in the recording. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I will be processing all of this and you'll get a follow-up email from me, which will include the recording and the slides. Um, I don't think there were any other links that we were talking about, but you'll probably get that tomorrow. Um, and you're welcome to respond to that email with any questions or respond to any email that you've ever gotten from me with any questions and it'll get, in, it'll end up in the right place. So yeah, totally. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you everyone for joining. I don't see any other questions. Um, Carolyn, nope, there's two different events. The ecotourism is uh, just ecotourism stuff and our business advisor, Peter Piccoli, I'm not actually sure. I haven't learned his last name entirely yet, so I apologize for the pronunciation there. Um, and that is May like 27th, I believe, but the e-commerce is May 24th. So next Monday is the e-commerce. And then yeah, the and that's, that's selling yeah. things online. Mainly we'll be talking about payment forms and we'll also be talking about online shopping carts as the main, I guess, drivers of e-commerce. Great. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions, so we'll give you a, back a little bit more time of your afternoon. And thank you all so much for joining us. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon.